Now we'll talk some uh, more of on force, continuing with the theory and hoping that you have actually worked out the first exercise on work. Okay, so force. There would be some force which will be acting when the body is in contact. For example, when a block is kept on a flow, friction force will act on it. Friction force can only act if there is a contact between the body and the ground. If there is no contact, friction force will not act. But other forces like a north pole of magnets and a south pole or another north pole of another magnet, these two will repel even when they are not in contact. So they act even from distance. Same goes with gravitational force. Earth will pull any object towards itself from distance. So they don't need contact. Similarly, charge and charge, two charges will attract or repel each other from distance. So they don't need a contact. They don't need a rubbing. The force does not act by the virtue of two bodies getting rubbed with each other. They can act from distance. They are non-contact forces. These are contact forces. Similarly, suppose when we, ha we have air molecules and we are throwing an object upward. Now, air molecules will actually cause resistance to this upward motion of the body. Now, they would come in contact. They will collide and try and give provide resistance to the upward movement of the object. Now, that is by the virtue of collision. Only when they, con they come in contact with each other, they rub each other. Friction force, I hope you know how does it act. When we look, go to the microscopic level, actually the surface is not smooth. It has spikes in, on the microscopic level like this. And the object which is kept on the ground, that too is not smooth. It has spikes of its own. And these two spikes get interlocked. So when you need to push, when you want to push the block, actually these have to break. These spikes at the microscopic level will break. Only then it will move ahead. That's why we see you see that there is considerable mass lo loss after considerable period of time due to friction. Whenever in the, in the machine parts, in the tires and tubes of vehicle, you see that they go thinner and thinner over the period of time because these 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 spikes they break over the period of time and very slowly but gradually you have a considerable mass loss so these this resistance of friction is because of the interlocking of the objects and the only way to break it overcome that is to break the interlockings so you have some mass loss so these contact forces you'll have some losses of energy similarly uh, this ball actually some molecules due to the collision of air molecule of ball negligible but there would be some mass loss of this ball as well whenever there is rubbing there is a contact of two material there would be rubbing and due to friction there will be some mass losses but the good thing about these forces which are non-contact force suppose there is a vacuum there is no air and a ball is coming down to the earth there is no mass loss so there is no loss of energy in these cases in case of electrostatic force or magnetic force or gravitational force or even in the case of spring force for that matter for example you have a spring like this and suppose we, we we stretch this we do some work on this spring and we stretch this and the spring gets elongated and stretched so once you hold the two end of the spring there is no friction between your hand on this and when you stretch this you do some work and then when you let let it loose then it will come to its original position and it does work on you because the spring then will be pulling you and we again pull it and we again so the spring energy would remain constant right now let's look at it from another vantage point we have a block on the ground we lift it up to a certain height now this block will gain some potential energy that we know that depends on the height and the potential energy is mgh that's okay now what what exactly happened let's try and understand and why did this block have any energy at all when we pull this up we do some work because the earth is pulling this block downwards and we have to overcome that force of the earth and we have to apply just the same amount of force if we don't want any kinetic energy to be gained by this block we have to apply just the same amount of force as the earth is as the earth is applying on the ground in the opposite direction and slowly slowly pull it up 
Now we are doing some work, our energy will be lost. So the energy that we are losing that is going into the system of block and earth. Because this is the potential energy between earth and the block. It's the same as the energy that exists between spring block system like this. When we stretch this, then there's some potential energy between in, in the spring block system. And when we let it loose, then that potential energy is converted into the kinetic energy of the block. Similarly, when we lift, actually what is what we are doing is we are separating the block and the earth. The earth, although is not moving, the block is moving, but these two are together and we are separating them. So we are actually doing some work in the separation of the block and the earth. And that work is getting converted into the potential energy of these the system of the earth and the block. And when we let it loose, they come together by the force of attraction that exists between them. And the potential energy is converted into the kinetic energy of the block. Okay, fine. Now let's imagine that we lift actually, we lift it to a height greater than the initial height. Let's call it as H1 and we lifted it to H2. Now, in that case, we lifted it to H2, it gained some potential energy which is more than the initial potential energy because the separation is more. And then we allowed it to come back to H1 height. So, all this happened very slowly. So, there is no kinetic energy gained by the system. We lifted it to H2 and then allowed it to come back slowly to H1. Now, in this case, let's see what happened. Now, we had to overcome the force of attraction on the earth uh, and uh, we did a lot more work than the previous case because we lifted it to height h2, the displacement is more, to separate them to a larger distance, we did more work. Simple, you can see from the formula, work is force into displacement, displacement is more, work done is more. Okay, so we did more work in lifting it to height h2. When we allowed it to come back, in that case, we did not do the work because it, when we let it loose, it will come back on its own. Now, all we did it, we did not allow, we did not cut the hold on the block. We allowed it to come down slowly. So, we constrained the motion so that it doesn't have, gain any kinetic energy, but actually it came down on its own. We did not apply any force for on the block to come it down. We just allowed, constrained its motion so that it doesn't gain any kinetic energy. We allowed it to come down slowly. But it did come down on its own. So in this course of journey from height H2 to height H1, the, we did not do work on the block. Rather, the block did the work on us. Because the, the block and earth system, to say uh, properly, did the work on us because the earth was pulling the block downwards and the motion of the block was indeed downwards. So force into displacement this time comes out to be positive for the earth because earth force is downwards. We on the other hand was constraining the motion of the block. So our force was upward and the displacement was downward. So work done by us was negative. Work done by us was negative, that means we did not do work, work was done on us. So work was done on me actually, the one who is, the one who lifted the block upward. So in the first stage of, in the first step of the process, I did more work and then when I allowed it to come back from H2 to H1, work was done on me. So I was compensated for the more work that I did in the first step. And the amount of work that I had to do in bringing the block to height H1 is the same as the amount of work that I did in bringing the block to height H2 and then back to H1. Because the extra work that I did in the first step was compensated later in the second step of the process. So actually I did more work and then some work was done on me. So net amount of work that I did is the same as the work that I did previously in bringing the block just to the height H1. So the thing is that the work that I did in the process is the same in both the process. So the work that I do actually depends only on the height and not on the path. 
this is very very important on the other hand if i am moving a block on the ground that has friction suppose i started from here and i moved it to a greater distance suppose i moved it to a distance b1 and i brought it back in the other case i moved it to a lesser distance d2 and then i brought it back but in this case the work done by me in both the cases will not be the same because work done the friction was acting all along to the distance d1 and it was acting all along back to back to the original position as well and importantly in both the cases friction was against me when i was pushing it forward the friction is acting backward and in this um, in in the, in the in the other half of the process when i was pushing it towards left then the friction was towards right when i was pushing it towards right the friction was towards left so friction is going to act all along against me so i have to do work work will not be done on me by friction i always have to do work on the block so work in this case will be greater in a larger the path which is larger larger length compared to the path which is of smaller length so work in this case doesn't depend on doesn't depend just on the position it depends on the path as well work in this case does not depend on the path the extra work if you do will be compensated for the extra work if you come back to the same position so net work that will be done will be the same no matter what the path is so prominently we have two different kind of forces in which the one in which there is no losses because of that the work will remain the same for example in the gravitation case of gravitational force also in the case of a spring force because if i stretch it more and then come up back to the mean position my net work will be zero because in the in the process of stretching it i do work on the spring in the process of relaxation spring will do work on me by the same exact amount work done will be zero no matter if i stretch it more and come back or if i stretch it less and come back my net work will be zero work doesn't depend upon how much i stretch is it work doesn't depend on the path work doesn't depend on the path similarly in the case of electrostatic force or magnetic force if there's a charge kept here of q coulomb plus and you bringing another q1 suppose q1 and you are bringing another q2 charge that is also have of positive sign then these two will repel okay so to bring q2 towards q1 we have to do some work and to bring q2 back to its initial position the work will, it will go on its own we don't actually have to do work we just have to constrain the motion of q2 but the work will be done by us on us in that case so whatever amount of work we do in bringing it closer to q1 the same amount of work will be done back on us in bringing q2 to back to its initial position same goes with poles of magnet so in these cases which are not contact forces like gravitational force magnetic force coulombic force and spring forces they actually the work does not depend on the path that we follow 